you that there is this second mathematic assignment due tomorrow, and I would like to go over one of the problems a little bit on that. So it's related to section 1.2, this extra reading due. Not the only extra reading, remember there's also that extra reading about the uh, theoretical perspectives with existence and uniqueness, which I'll continue to go over some today. But on this assignment, again, like thought last week, uh, due tomorrow, due on Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Uh, this one will be due tomorrow. We've got a bunch of stuff to read and X five exercises to do. And let's see, I think the one I wanted to focus on is either in this section or this one. Let me try this one here. And yeah, it was this one here. Um, exercise six. Here are the directions. Write the solution of this initial value problem in what's called implicit form. Then use contour plot to make a graph of this implicit equation you just found. Describe the largest piece of this graph, which defines the function, which is the unique solution of this initial value problem on some sort of maximal interval of existence, which we might have to just approximate from a graph. Although I'm, I'm giving you a hint that it includes all positive numbers, but not all negative numbers. So what's going on here? Um, well, the reading is supposed to help you with this, but you, if you try separating variables here, I'll just show you what happens. So you've got dy dt equals t squared over 1 plus y cubed. If we separate variables and bring the y's on the left and the t's on the right, that, which we now integrate. Right hand side is plenty easy. t cubed over 3 plus c, or maybe you call it c1. Left hand side is easy to integrate, however, if you're going to solve for y, you've got a fourth degree equation to solve for y in terms of dt. Now technically that's actually possible to do. Let's, let's see if Mathematica can do it. Let me just do the algebra part of that, not the calculus. So I'm going to use solve here to see what kind of algebraic monster we're looking at here. y plus y to the fourth equals equals t cubed over 3 plus c. Solve that for y. It's actually possible, but you know, not very nice. <coughs> Actually, this might be giving us four different <laughs> answers, I think. None of which is very nice. So it's preferable to work with this equation as is, in what's called implicit form. Don't explicitly solve for y as a function of t. Leave the equation in the simpler form, and it's called an implicit form. And actually, if I went to a fifth degree equation, there is no general formula for the answer, though there could be a specific formula for the specific function. In general, it can be very difficult or even impossible to solve for y explicitly. So this is essentially, this thing equaling that is essentially an implicit form of the answer. For the general solution, at least. We actually have an initial value problem here. Y of 0 equals 0. If you plug in Y equals 0 and T equals 0, you get C equals 0. So setting C equal to 0 here gives you the implicit form of the unique solution of the initial value problem. You can plot an equation like that without using the regular plot command for functions. Instead, you can use contraplot. If you took multivariable calculus, we used contour plot a lot in that class, mostly to make what are called level curves of functions. Contour plot can be used to plot individual equations where you don't necessarily solve for y explicitly. I'll just copy and paste this equation without the c in there. You do need a range of values for both t and y. I'll just try negative 5 to 5. There we go. Kind of an interesting looking curve. Add some axes in here. 
horizontal axis would be the t-axis, the vertical axis would be the y-axis. It's not the graph of a function. Why not? Yeah, it fails the vertical line test. There are vertical lines that go through more than once. However, there's a piece of it does that includes the initial condition at 0, 0. This piece that goes on forever up here does not go on forever over there. It stops right about there. You want to look for that location for where that's the tangent line is vertical. Actually, you can find that through implicit differentiation, perhaps at least. You might be able to find that location. I don't know if you remember implicit differentiation. You can pretend this equation implicitly defines y as a function of t near some point, and it does as long as you are now in a place where the tangent is vertical. And you can differentiate both sides with respect to t. The derivative of y with respect to t is not zero, because I'm assuming y is a function of t. The derivative of y with respect to t is dy dt. The derivative of y to the fourth over four with respect to t is not zero, because again, I'm assuming y is a function of t. You need the chain rule, bring the four down in front, four, to four divided by four is one, you get y cubed, but then the derivative of the inside function is dy dt. Actually, this is going to lead us back to the differential equation. If I differentiate this side, I get t squared. I could, yeah, it's leading us back to the differential equation. Which, if you think about it, you should be able to guess. Can we figure out where that's vertical? What the location of this point is? Actually, you can. Where is the denominator zero? What value of y? Negative one. That would be the y coordinate, the second coordinate of that point. And when y is negative one, we can solve for t. From this equation, negative one to the fourth is going to be positive one. Negative one plus positive one fourth is going to be negative three fourths. Multiply both sides by 3. t cubed is 9 fourths. So t is going to be the cube root of 9 fourths, a negative 9 fourths, which is a negative number. It does exist. You could also write that as the negative cube root of positive 9 fourths. Not too far away from negative 1, but it is certainly not exactly equal to negative 1. You need to divide by 4 in the equation. For y plus okay. y to the 4 to the 4. I don't know if that's what Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for catching that. Oops. John, it's okay. Nice. Doesn't change it a whole lot. Similar shape. So look at this point again, the y coordinate is negative 1, the t coordinate is not exactly negative 1. Okay, it would be the cube root of negative 9 force, the negative cube root of 9 force, and you can approximate that. Okay, so you can actually, you don't have to just approximate the answer, this maximum level of existence, you can find it exactly. Technically speaking, the function has a vertical tangent line there, so the derivative is undefined. So technically speaking, because of that, you probably should not include this number as the left end point of this maximal interval. Make it an open interval. Do not include the left end point. Does that make sense? We're picking off a piece of the graph that does satisfy the vertical line test. All right, that's one of the trickier questions, I think, on the, on the um, homework. 
I do want to talk some more about existence and uniqueness today, but I'm going to save that for the, the last 10 minutes of class or so. We want to continue talking about phase lines, sink sources, and nodes for autonomous differential equations, but in the context of a population model and related to the next completion assignment, which is called, uh, related to something called bifurcations and bifurcation diagrams for families of autonomous differential equations. Let's look at some population modeling. So I'm going back to the census data from the first day of class. The U.S. population, remember that uh, 1790 was when the first census was taken, and the population in 1790 was 3.9 million people. Uh, 281 million people, this last data point corresponds to the census taken in the year 2000, 210 years <coughs> after the first census in 1790. We plotted these points, and before we used an exponential model, and we saw how well the exponential model did, and it wasn't too well. I even tried allowing myself to change the parameters, including the P0, the initial population, to make a better fit overall. Actually, the K was the better thing to try to change. But we never got a really good fit. Does a logistic model do better? Call what the logistic model is. <laughs> the derivative of the population with respect to time is equal to some constant k times p times 1 minus p over n. K and N are both positive constants. What was N called? The carrying capacity. The carrying capacity, right. K is like a relative growth, uh, an actual growth rate is a, excuse me, a relative growth rate when P is small. When P is close to zero, this factor is close to one. Essentially, the model is approximately exponential when P is small. So K is like a relative growth rate at the beginning, in a sense. That was the logistic model. Let's see if we can, how well a logistic model does. Now I have some extra stuff here that I don't have time for to go over some data analysis. Actually, it's pretty similar to the data analysis in that reading that you handed in last Tuesday, the assignment. I don't have time to go over it. What we'll do instead is we will use D cell value to solve the generic logistic model for an, a generic initial condition here. Actually, I've already got the output right here. This is the output that you get. We can define a function using that output, and then we can plot it with the data in the background. Okay, so I just picked an Pick P0 to again be the initial population in 1790 at 3.9 million people. K, I just sort of arbitrarily picked to be 0 0.03 to start with. And N, I arbitrarily picked to be 330, saying the carrying capacity of the U.S. is 330 million. Is that really true? I'm sure it's not really true, okay? It's just, we're just trying to fit the data. How well does this does? Well, kind of like the exponential model did, it does pretty well the first 60, 70 years for sure. Maybe even up to the first 100 or even 110 years, but then after that it's off. Though the amount that it's off is not too bad overall compared to the exponential model. You might remember the exponential model kept going up pretty fast about like that. Do you have a question, Dan? Okay. And actually it works pretty well there, just sort of by chance in the year two, uh, 210 years after 1790 in the year 2000. But that seems kind of like a fluke, because it's not doing so well in here. I can shift these parameters and see if I can get a better fit. And in doing so, you can see it definitely does better than the exponential model does, as an overall trend. Okay? It's not really scientific when I'm doing that, when I'm just playing with these parameters. But if all you're after is a pretty good fit, it's, it's not too bad. All right. So... That can do better. What we want to consider today, though, is something else. What if we allow for harvesting of a population? 
Now, I don't mean harvesting humans, okay? I mean like harvesting fish, fishing, or hunting for deer, for example. What if we allow that for a population? What can happen to the model? Or what, how should we modify the model and what will happen to the solutions? Any initial thoughts about how you might model that? Actually, if you took out two from me, this should seem familiar. Anybody take out two from me? Say you allowed harvesting, say it's fishing, and you allowed fishing in a certain lake. Um, you you um, distribute fishing licenses, and you expect, based on that, that people are going to harvest, they're going to fish, say, 100,000 fish a year or something. Think about the units, 100,000 fish per year. The units are the same. Have an idea? Yeah, just drop a minus 1,000 or 100,000. Minus 100,000, yeah. If P is in fish, you'd subtract 100,000. If it was in thousands of fish, if P was in thousands of fish, you'd subtract 100. Subtracting a constant, I'll call the constant, I was going to call it C. Maybe I should call it H for harvesting. C could be confusing with the general solution. By subtracting it like this, I'm assuming that the harvesting rate is uniform throughout the year. For example, if 100,000 fish are caught every year, how many fish would that be per day if it's at a constant rate? Somewhere around 300 to 400, something like that. Fish per day. You're assuming throughout the year that it's a constant rate. That's not necessarily true. Okay? But it keeps things simple. So now we have a third parameter, a third constant, H, representing this constant halving rate say in fish per year. How does that affect things? Well, let's see if D-Sol value can deal with it. So I'll go ahead and put a minus H in there. Can it deal with it? I'm not sure. I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. Let's see what happens. Well, it's giving us some dangerous signals here. Inverse functions are being used, so some solutions may not be found. So it's given us an answer. So based on the warning, it's hard to know if it's going to be correct or good, so to speak. It might depend on what the initial condition is, perhaps. Let's go ahead and test it to see if, it's, if it might be a good idea, if it might really work here. I'll go ahead and use this kind of notation that I already used. I'm using subscripts here on the feed function to indicate, to allow myself to change parameters for the logistic model. P0 was the initial population. K was the uh, growth, relative growth rate when the population is small and is the carrying capacity. Now I'm adding this other parameter, H. I can also make that a subscript. I have a bunch of subscripts here. And just copy and paste this thing. No matter how nasty it looks, we can at least copy and paste it. Is it going to work? Well, let's plot it. Um, I'm not necessarily looking at harvesting people in the US here, so I probably should get rid of the data for the population of the U.S. I don't need to show anymore either. H has become an animation parameter as well. I do need to close off the plot here. Oh, okay, the plot, let's move, let's get rid of this one. The plot can be closed off after the plot range right there. What should I pick for H? I don't know. Um, let's pick something small to start with. 
Actually, let's start at zero. So initially, there's no harvesting in my initial looking at this graph. But I don't know, just to make a guess, let's allow it to go up to 100 just to see what happens. It is on a scale relative to the carrying capacity that initially is set at 330. So in the context of the U.S. population, if we were being, if we were being harvested by aliens, okay, <laughs> heaven forbid, uh, in the context of that being 330 million, this would be, we'd be harvested at a rate of 100 million people per year. Okay. All right. I think everything's okay. Let's see what happens. Okay, so that's not surprising because H is zero. But what happens as I increase the harvesting rate? What happens to the solution? Whoa! <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Strange stuff. It looks like the harvesting rate doesn't have to get very high. Now we're harvesting people at a rate of one million per, per year. I guess this is more fun to pretend that we're being harvested. H doesn't even make it to one million people per year before we all die off. Well, T would be in years, so we would die off over the, over the course of 30 years here. Okay, some sort of big change is happening as H changes. We go from this kind of graph to this kind of graph. When a big change like that occurs as a parameter, a constant changes, huh? How can constants change? They change because we let them change in our minds. Okay? For each fixed value of these constants, k, n, and h, there's a slope field and there are solutions in the slope field. But I can change those constants, and changing h greatly affects what happens. Letting h change, let's go over a bigger interval too. Letting H change greatly affects what happens. At some point, it seems perhaps around point one one or so, it's a big change. When a big change like that happens, as a parameter change, it's got a name, it's called a bifurcation, is what it's called. Somewhere between 0.11 and 0.12 here, there's a bifurcation, a big change in the nature of the solution. It goes from increasing to decreasing. Actually, we want to ignore the part that's to the right of the vertical asymptote, that doesn't make any sense as far as the model goes you'd only focus on that lower left part. All right, well, is there a way we could figure out why that happens? And maybe even predict the exact value of h where it happens? Yeah, what you can do is you can take this right-hand side function, thought of as a function of p, and graph it and see what happens to that function of p as h changes. Now again, there are three parameters here, k, n, and h. So technically speaking, they should all be subscripts of the right-hand side function. I'm not going to bother, at least on the board, maybe not in mathematic either, maybe I'll plug in the specific values of k, k, and n that I start with here. I'm only going to make the h the subscript. Let's go ahead and use the values of k and n that I picked here. k being 0 0.03, n being 330, I think. 30, yep. Oh, I forgot the factor of p in here. It's 0, 3. P times 1 minus P over 330 minus H. What is the 
graph of that look like? I'm talking about the graph of the right hand side function. <clears throat> I'm not talking about a solution graph. What does the graph of that look like? You should, you should be able to describe it. What kind of function is that? Quadratic, yeah. Graph of a quadratic is called a starts with P. Um, Go ahead. Parabola. You said it. Parabola. <coughs> Opening upward or downward in this case? Downward. Downward. A downward opening parabola because the coefficient of P is negative. Coefficient, excuse me, the coefficient of p squared is negative. It's that. Does it have any roots? Does this quadratic have any roots? It's hard to talk and type at the same time. Does this quadratic have any roots? Say when h is zero. Yes. The answer is it does. It depends on h. When h is zero, it's got roots. Zero and three hundred and thirty. P equals zero and p equals three hundred and thirty, which correspond for the differential equation to what? Equilibrium solution. Which correspond in the phase line to what? Equilibrium points. If H changes, though, what happens? What if I let H increase from? 0 to 0 0.12. What do you think is going to happen? Any ideas? What do you think is going to happen as I increase H here? I'm going to drop below the x axis. Yeah, h is being subtracted from the original function in this form. That's like a vertical translation. As h increases, it's going to translate straight down. Not as fast as I was guessing. What happened here? Oh, okay. It's not as fast as I was guessing, but it's still fast enough to make the initial population die off. Okay, I got to clarify what happened here. Technically speaking, what happened with the U.S. population itself is a bifurcation, but actually, overall, for the entire model, there's still not quite a bifurcation yet. When h is 0.12, the graph looks like this. It's still got two horizontal intercepts. This would be a p-axis here. One at about uh, looks like maybe six, four, five, or six, and the other at 325 or so. The initial US population of 3.9 is to the left of this in value. If you think of this as a p-axis, in the, in the solution graph, the p-axis is vertical. Remember, there's this confusion sometimes about sometimes it's vertical, sometimes it's horizontal. In the slope field, the solution graph has a vertical axis that's labeled with p. In this graph, which is not a solution graph, the horizontal axis is labeled with and 3.9 is a little lower than that, corresponding to a, a spot where this graph is negative, meaning the PVT is also negative, meaning the solution curve decreases. If I had a different initial population back up here, 
pick the initial population to be 10, for example. Well, I guess I can go ahead and enter this and just make it that way by sliding it over. Now as h goes from 0 to 0.12, for that solution, there's not a big change. So what I said earlier is actually not technically quite correct. It's a bifurcation, a big change in the sense that for that particular solution, we end up dying off. But overall, it's actually not a bifurcation. For the overall system, the phase line still looks the same, even when h is 0.12. If you draw the phase line, think of that as a p-axis, there are two equilibrium points Turns out this top one is a sink and the bottom one is a source. When h equals 0, this one's at p equals 0, and this one's at p equals 330. I'll go ahead and say that. When h equals 0 here, this is at p equals 0, and this is at p equals 330. The initial condition of 3.9 leads to a solution that increases toward 330. Like that, if we graph it in the slope field. But when h is a little higher, like 0.12, then that graph, that quadratic, does get shifted downward, not by much, but by shifting it downward, that's making its two roots go toward each other, which means for the slope field and for the phase line these two equilibrium solutions and equilibrium points get closer together a little bit. They're going to be above this one and below this one. I could approximate it approximately where this one is about five or six. And this one's about 325 or so. It's still got the same overall qualitative behavior. This one's, there's still equilibrium points, two of them. This one's a sink and this one's a source. But because of our initial population being below this one, below the source, that's why the U.S. population died off. Again, if we change the initial condition, the P0, even when H gets to 0.12, they don't die off. Okay. We don't get a true bifurcation occurring until H is large enough to make these two equilibrium points, the sink and the source, merge. And then they actually annihilate each other. It's like a, it's like a matter and antimatter collision. Okay? Not literally, it's just you're pretending it is. There's going to be some value of H. I'm not sure what it is. Call it question mark here to begin with where these two equilibrium points are going to come together and merge into one that will actually be a node and then when h is larger than that h is larger than question mark then there are no equilibria the graph of the right hand side function will always be below the horizontal axis there it will always be negative in value meaning your derivatives are always negative your solutions are always decreasing. No matter what the initial population is, it dies off in that case. So the bifurcation occurs when you go from a situation where there are two equilibria, one of which is a sink, one of which is a saddle, and because of that, many solution curves still don't end up leading to populations dying off. But when we cross over into the regi regime where H is large enough to make those two equilibria go away, then a bifurcation has occurred. A big change in the overall system, a big change in the phase line. How high does H need to be? Let's see if we can figure it out. What, what would be a tool we could figure out how high H needs to be to be at question mark there? What would be an algebraic tool we can use to solve for that? Solve. Solve on Mathematica. What, what should I solve? The right hand side. Make the right hand side equal zero. Equal zero. Figure out a value of h that will make that zero just at one point. 
Okay, now we can do that with Mathematica. I think it's probably better to do it with the quadratic formula, though. Let's write it down in a form that will allow us to use the quadratic formula more easily. And we actually don't have to use the full quadratic formula to figure out the bifurcation point. We only need the part under the square root. Do you think you know why? <clears throat> why can we get away in figuring out what value of h leads to this big change, this bifurcation? Why can we get away with just looking at the thing under the radical? discriminant it's sometimes called. Well, it's the only part of the quadratic formula that H actually has. That's true. It's also the part that separates the two the two roots of the quadratic formula. Yeah, uh-huh. You're right. So if they equal each other, if the positive that equals the negative that, so if that equals zero. If the thing under the square root equals zero, then the plus or minus doesn't have an effect. If it's positive, then the plus or minus does have an effect. If it's negative, what happens? What if the thing under the square root is negative? Then these solutions are complex numbers involving the imaginary unit i. And so on this real number line, it's like they don't exist. Actually, we will see that complex numbers involving the imaginary unit i are useful later on in this course. But here, we're, they, they're just separating the case between two real roots and two complex roots. So uh, with the quadratic formula, I'll go ahead and write down the roots of this, the full quadratic formula here. Negative b is going to be negative 0.03. Should we sing the song? For all time? Dare I sing? What do you think, Ben? We might as well. <clears throat> you can sing it with me. I've got to get the right note first here. P is equal to negative B. Negative B plus or minus the square root. P squared minus 4AC all over 2A. You never learned that song. You never learned that song, did I? <laughs> b is 0 0.03, so we have negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac. Uh, in that room here, a is a big long number here. Small number, but it's long, right? I didn't do too bad in my singing, did I? Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, no problem. Check it. Make sure I don't make a mistake here. Those would be the two equilibria. They're going to be two real equilibria when this quantity under the square root is positive. It's going to be one real equilibrium when it's zero. That's going to be the question mark value of h. And two complex equilibria when the thing under the square root is negative. But we don't worry about that. So when is this zero? <coughs> Should have brought my calculator. Point zero three squared. It will end up be, being a minus sign here because we're going to have um, three minuses giving us a minus. So minus four times 0 0.00009090091 approximately times h for using a, approximate numbers there with that decimal. Set that equal to zero and solve for h. You don't have to worry about these little apostrophes there when you copy and paste numerical output in Mathematica. Those are often there, just indicating there's extra um, 
digits of accuracy that are being hidden. That's what that means. Looks like the bifurcation value of H is about 2.475. So question mark here is 2.475. So if I let H go above that, then no matter what the initial condition is, it'll die off. The population will die off. Two point four seven five. Let's go up to two point five. Okay, we're we're not looking at solutions here. We're looking at the graph of the right hand side. So when H is really close to 2.5, the very end, 2.475, that all of a sudden we get below the horizontal axis. So in the slope field for the differential equation, if I let H get that high, no matter how high my initial condition is, let's make P0 large this time. Let's start it out at maybe 200 million. Maybe even go as high as 300 million, or even higher, for that matter, 400 million. No matter what P0 is, once H gets high enough, it dies off. Now, we're not looking at a long enough time frame to see it here. Let's go to 5,000 years instead of 500 years. Oh, i got to go out to 5,000 this way, too. When H is at 2.5, yeah, no matter how high P0 is, it dies off. Okay? If I let H be a tiny bit lower, it doesn't that? If I let H be 2.475, we get into trouble here. Okay, that's probably because we're exactly in the dot there. 2.474. Doesn't die off for a high initial population, though if it was lower, it would die off. Okay? So bifurcations occur when there's a big change. The best way to say it probably is that there's a big change in the phase line. Typically, it's like two equilibria are coming together, merging and annihilating each other as the parameter changes. That's the typical way they occur. And oftentimes, on simple examples, at least the quadratic formula, and figuring out where the thing under the square root is zero, help you find the bifurcation point, the location of the parameter, the value of the parameter where the big change occurs. Okay, it's kind of a tricky subject. Uh, and you can certainly come up with examples that are so hard that they're practically impossible to do. Um, but your homework problems are doable, your completion problems, and you should do your best. There are three videos that I suggested you watch over the weekend, though I'm imagining probably most people didn't. I'm guessing. Uh, highly suggested old videos that I made, the supplementary videos, that have more examples of bifurcation problems. Okay? And you probably need more examples than just this. There are examples in the book and there are some video examples. I highly, highly recommend watching them. And by the way, in the first one, you actually get a, a fun surprise. Okay? If you're kind of dozing off watching it, all of a sudden you'll get awakened. Okay? There's kind of a fun surprise in the first bifurcation video. And I'll let you find out what it is. And I hope that entices you to want to find out. All right, in the time we have remaining, though, we'll, we'll talk more about bifurcations on Wednesday. But in the time we have remaining, I think we should go back to existence and uniqueness stuff. Way up here. There we go. And so, again, this is related to this extra reading. There's no homework problems in this extra reading. But you should study it and try to learn it for the exam coming up Friday of next week already. There's going to be a second extra reading assignment that I'm going to assign later tomorrow after you're done with mathematical homework number two, which again will just be reading, no extra problems to work on. Um, it'll be even harder than the first reading assignment, though, and I'll start going over that on Wednesday. For the time we have left today, about five minutes, let me just take a look at the proof of the, these theorems. 
proofs. Okay? These are proofs you should be able to understand. So let's take a look at them. So the first one is for this pure antiderivative problem, dy dt equals f of t, y of t0 equals y0. I could have used t0 equals 0. I didn't. Okay, this is a little bit more arbitrary. I'm assuming little f is continuous for all real values of t. I could have assumed it over just some interval, but to keep it simple, I said for all real values. The conclusion of this theorem is, has four parts. Part A, the solution exists. There is a function that solves a differential equation, which I emphasized last week is not a trivial thing, right? because we saw the example with the Fresnel function. You might have a, a problem where the antiderivative has no formula that you're used to. Maybe you have to give that function a name, like Fresnel, or something like that. Or maybe you can name a function after yourself and copyright it. And anybody time, anytime somebody uses that function, they have to pay you a dollar or something. Maybe. I don't know. Doesn't mean your function will be useful, though. Okay? It exists, even if there's no formula for it. And therefore, that gives us comfort in approximating the solution with, for example, Euler's method, that we're not approximating nothing. We're, we are approximating a true function. Second part, if capital F of t is a solution, then so is capital F of t plus c. Vertical translations of solutions are solutions. Part c is kind of the flip side of that. All solutions are vertical translations of each other. If you've got two solutions, they must differ by a constant. One must be a constant plus the other. Finally, solutions are unique. All right, proof of part a. I did mention this last Friday. The proof of part a is essentially the fundamental theorem of calculus in this form that says that if you differentiate an integral where the upper limit of integration is the variable, you get the integrand now. It's best to use a different variable here for this integrand here. I like using tau because it's the Greek version of t. I want to emphasize that the variable for this function we're defining is in this, in this upper limit of integration. We had that example on Friday with the piecewise function that illustrated it in kind of a strange way illustrated the truth of this. Little f actually doesn't have to be differential. It just continues. This is still true. The, the integral will be differential if little f is continuous. So you can um, say by adding y0 to that, you can say this function satisfies this initial value problem. Because now when you plug in t equals t0, this integral becomes 0 you get y0 plus 0 is y0 that solves the initial value problem too. So you should be able to understand that. I'm not claiming you understand how to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, but if you trust that form of it, if you believe it and use it, then you can prove part A pretty easily. I mean, it looks complicated, but you should be able to follow that. Part B says again that um, vertical translations are Solutions are still solutions, so if I add a constant to any solution, if I consider the function f of t plus c, that will also be a solution. So if we differentiate that, we get little f, and the reason is because of linearity. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, and because the derivative of a constant function is zero. That's why that happens. Part c, which says all solutions are vertical translations of each other, relies on something called the constant function theorem, which is itself relies on something called the mean value theorem, which I'm not going to get into. The constant function theorem says the if the derivative of a function is always zero, the function must be constant. Okay? So if we assume we've got two solutions like this, we want to show they differ by a constant. We want to show their, the derivative of their difference is zero. Right here. That's our goal. And that comes just from this, the fact that we assume they're both solutions means these two equations are true for all t. Okay. Actually, that's a fact from calculus that you would know that means they differ by constant right away because of the constant function theorem. Your calculus teacher told you that when you do an antiderivative problem, you can just put a plus c to get the most general antiderivative. 
if you want to prove it a little bit more real rigorously, you can use this constant function here to show this that since this derivative is always zero, that means this difference is a constant. That means g is f plus c. Finally, you, the uniqueness comes from the fact that um, if two functions are solutions, capital F is another solution compared to phi. Then by part C, they are equal, they, are, they differ by a constant. This equation is true for all t. However, they both satisfy the same initial value problem. And that means the C must be zero so that the functions are the same. Okay? So I know I went over that kind of fast. Um, and you might be feeling sleepy and you didn't follow it. Okay? Maybe watch it and watch the video. But you're probably going to get more benefit out of just studying it on your own and trying to reason it through on your own. You should also study the proof of the, the next theorem as well. I don't have time for that. You can't put, prove part A. It's too hard. Um, we can prove part B. So you should make sure you look at that proof. Okay? See you on Wednesday. <laughs>